So let's talk about general equilibrium and causality. What have been a little bit of a puzzle? What we've done here, the finance approach, uh, let's look at just the case of the interest the rate. Equation: Interest rate is 1 over expected discount, uh, expected discount factor. And we read this equation as from the properties of consumption growth, this determines the interest rate. But macroeconomists and microeconomists use exactly the same equation in a different way. They just put the, uh, the marginal utility consumption on the left-hand side. They write the equation this way. And then they say, no, 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 no. This equation is how, the, uh, given the interest rate, how consumption is determined. Macroeconomists say, uh, given the Fed setting interest rates and expectations of future consumption, this is the equation that tells you where consumption comes from today. Microeconomists would look at this just as a, a apples and oranges bit of economics. There's an interest rate, there's a utility function, and that is how, given the interest rate and the utility function, the consumer decides on how much consumption. So what is it? Which is the chicken and which is the egg? Is it consumption determining interest rates, or is it interest rates determining consumption? Similarly, let's look at what we've done for risk premiums. We've, we've written our basic equation. Expected return is covariance of return times consumption growth with only one need for a risk aversion coefficient. And we read that as given consumption growth, given the covariance of consumption growth with returns, this equation determines expected returns. But wait a minute. Consumption's an endogenous variable to the economy. Tomorrow's return is primarily determined by tomorrow's price. That's going to be the endogenous variable tomorrow. What are we doing saying that's exogenous determining expected returns? Well, to answer these questions, we really have to fill in the, the missing assumptions. We have to fill in the general equilibrium. Where does supply come from? What we're really looking at here is the demand curve. And to understand questions of what's the chicken and what's the egg, you have to do the rest of economics where demand intersects supply, and that's what general equilibrium is all about. So let's run through a couple cases, and you can see how this, how this exogeneity question can come out differently. Here's one case, the endowment economy, made popular by Bob Lucas in his, his famous paper. So one possibility for general equilibrium is we live in what's called the coconut economy. Uh, what we get to eat today is just how many coconuts fall from the trees. And that's called E, the endowment. If that's the supply of the economy, the production possibilities frontier, the technological possibilities for what you can eat today and what you can eat tomorrow, looks like a square. You can eat only so much as coconuts fall today and so much as what coconuts fall tomorrow, but there's no technological way for you to transform coconuts from today till tomorrow. Now, if that's the way the production side of the economy works, here is how general equilibrium works. And let's think through that general equilibrium. There's many people on this island. They trade, and they, they, they can borrow and lend coconuts. So each individual says, aha, I'm perfectly free to borrow and lend coconuts at the interest rate. To each individual, they face the interest rate and decide how much to eat each day. But of course, the interest rate has to adjust until the total supply of coconuts equals the total demand for coconuts. So from the economy's point of view, it is in fact true that the endowment is the exogenous variable and the interest rate is the endogenous variable. So if we fill things out with the Lucas view of uh, the supply side of the economy and the general equilibrium, though to each individual, P equals E of MX is in fact, uh, they take interest rates of Gizen and decide their consumption stream, to the aggregate economy, it's the other way around. The consumption stream is exogenous, and shifts in the consumption stream will change interest rates. If more coconuts fall today, interest rates will change today. Now, case two, that's, that's not very realistic. The traditional theory of finance uh, posited a different production technology. The traditional theory of finance wrote down a process for the rate of return, which I'll just make the interest rate for the graphical position and then thought about people, in fact, deciding their consumption, deciding their portfolios, given rates of return. So that's a general equilibrium model. It's a perfectly fine general equilibrium model. That's what would happen on our, our little island economy if every time you left a coconut in the ground, RF coconuts uh, sprang up tomorrow. Technology would then determine the interest rate, and the endogenous question would be consumption today and tomorrow. So if that were the general equilibrium, then both for the individual and the, the economy, uh, the interest rate would be the exogenous thing. The consumption growth today and tomorrow would be the endogenous thing. 
uh, and the function of our equation, our p equals e of mx, would be in fact determining consumption, determining the composition of the market portfolio, rather than determining asset prices in a true exogeneity fashion. Well, neither of these is true, of course. Uh, truth, uh, that uh, a, a real model, looks something like this, case three reality. In fact, there is a production possibility frontier, which is curved. Uh, as we plant more and more coconuts, the rate of return that we get out of those coconuts is lower and lower. So the production possibility frontier works like that. And the economy settles in an equilibrium that looks like this with uh, an interest rate. And everything's endogenous. And that is the way the world works. Now, uh, given that that's our world, and in fact, everything's endogenous, is it wrong to proceed as we have and think of consumption as determining asset prices? There's a theorem that says no. What we've done is just fine. It's not wrong. It will not give us wrong predictions about the world. Suppose that we live in a true economy that I've, I've, I've given you in the blue, but we model it as an endowment economy. And we send our statisticians out who do a very good job of figuring out what equilibrium consumption turns out to be, and then plug into our computer models as if it was an endowment economy. Well, as you can see, the black line and the blue line generate the same interest rates and the same consumption. So if you model the equilibrium consumption process correctly, there's no error. There's no error in your predictions about how consumption and asset returns uh, uh, move over time by imagining it were a Lucas economy. Similarly, if you model the rates of return correctly, if you model the stochastic process for rates of return, their conditional means, their conditional variances, there would be nothing wrong in writing down that economy and studying the relationship between rates of return and consumption, even though it's really generated by a general equilibrium economy like that. What would go wrong is, of course, if you start making statements about causality, about what happens if we start taxing returns, what happens if, if, if we have a technological shock, those sorts of things would go wrong. Same, same thing. We, we have taken our betas as exogenous. We've thought about the covariance of consumption growth with returns as, as determining expected returns, but nothing of the sort is true. Let's write out expected returns as covariance of discount factor with tomorrow's return. And even if we think the dividend is exogenous, a fixed cash flow, which we just model, well, tomorrow's price is as endogenous as it can possibly be, and tomorrow's consumption reflects consumers' expectations of future returns, consumers' expectations of the future. That's as endogenous as it could possibly be. So this stuff is endogenous as well. Is this hopeless? No. The bottom line of, of this thought is, first, price equals expected discounted payoff. It's a condition that must hold. It's part of a general equilibrium. It's a demand curve. Well, demand curves have to hold in general equilibrium. Price equals expected discounted payoff just looking at the demand side and not really worrying about supply is very useful in many applications. And the bottom line for finance is not theoretical purity. The bottom line is, have you found a theory that is useful in the application at hand? You can often stop there and not worry about the general equilibrium foundations. But beware in doing so about using words like explain, cause, endogenous. Beware about, about making general equilibrium statements of what would happen if technology changed out of a model that doesn't get the right general equilibrium. People use those words, especially the explain, all the time, and they're usually using them wrong. Third, it's interesting, and we will close the course, by thinking about real general equilibrium models. The real model of finance specifies, yes, demand, the utility function, but also specifies the supply the technological production possibilities, the investment opportunities, how new companies are formed, and is the shocks are truly exogenous shocks, things like technology shocks, taste shocks, uh, shocks to market structure, things that are truly exogenous and, and, and move around the supply and the demand curve. That's a hard task. Macroeconomics really hasn't come up with one, and these exogenous shocks remain ephemeral. But that, of course, is the only kind of model that you're going to be able to use if you really want to talk about explaining, causing, and exogenous. For the moment, keep in mind that what we're looking at is a first order condition. It's a demand curve. It does have to hold. But the bottom line is whether it's useful. <laughs>